Welcome, I'm Josh Dreyfus and this is Session Zero, a roleplay-focused tabletop group. The current adventure is the Heart of Aether. This is part four, the Heart of Silver. The party have just descended into the laboratory in the center of the city and are deciding whether they will or will not free the silver dragon which is being harvested for its Aether. Let's meet our players. Hi, I'm Callum, playing Mulak Drab, the party's bard, also a bit of a relic hunter, and today I'm going to try and do some cool stuff with a dragon. Hello, I'm Ray Sharling, and I play a human barbarian called Rage, and this is what she sounds like. Very Welsh, um, definitely not indicative of who I am, where I'm from. She's hot-headed, a bit chaotic, and um, a little bit crazy. So, yeah, we'll see what she gets up to. Hello, I am playing Yamara Trix. She is a high-born elf. She thinks she's very fancy, and she likes uh, to be very vain um, and doesn't want to touch dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's discuss the city of Albion so far. You were invited over because you found a flyer in the tavern that you were in, and the, the barkeep, Brit, was a little bit sick of you kind of drinking all of his ale and losing at all the gambling games you're doing. So you travelled over the city of Albion to see what was going on. You found a couple of exhibits about Aether, and the entire city was built impossibly fast and is mostly magical. How did you find the city itself? More like. It's fantastic. I've, I've never seen anything like it. All, all the technology and... Mm. Just people not actually doing any work, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of really strong people. So, you know, kind of want to show my strength amongst them because I want to make sure that I'm respected, but uh, not too, not too fa like fond of the magic. The magic's kind of scary. I don't really like magic that can manipulate things in ways that weapons can't. That's really true because I don't like the people here because of what they're doing with the magic because it feels unnatural to me because normally magic is to help you do things but not do everything for you and I feel like without their magic they will have nothing left. But That is entirely true. The city has come to rely far too heavily on its constant supply of aether. You met Orban Jenkins who had built the airship in the graveyard, the, uh, the junkyard to the corner to the north of the, the city and with his daughter Helena. And then you also met some of the enforcers, led by Augustus, this rather cocky, arrogant, confident man who was remarkably strong himself, but is enhanced massively by the mech suit that he walks around in, and also Athena, the head of city defense, the sorceress, again, who is enhanced by her magical suit. Now, Augustus is, in his suit, much stronger and faster than an Harrog, and Athena, in her enhancing suit, is much more powerful and much more capable of manipulating aether and magical energy than yamara is but a lot of their power comes from the enhancements they're given from their suits above the city we also have the sentinel the ship endlessly flying around and now the party have descended down into the bowels of the heart of aether and discovered that it is in fact a silver dragon giving the city all of its power it was timothy the melted and disfigured enforcer who took pity on you wanting to find out answers for what happened to Helena and so allowed you into the Heart of Aether. Timothy has stood guard to give you as much time as he can, but the last thing we knew was Timothy's broken body was thrown into the central control room that you're currently in by Augustus as he strides in, effectively telling you it's time for all of you to die. And that's where we start now. Augustus standing there defiantly staring at you. The blast shield dropped and the glass face revealing the silver dragon being harvested in the room beyond and the head enforcer simply stares at all of you. And he says, one rule. I asked you to do one thing. One simple request. Don't go into the heart. We opened our city to you. I gave you my own personal recommendation. I showed you round. I asked you for one thing. And you couldn't do that. Why? Before... I deal with you. Just tell me why. I want to know the unknown. And this was very much unknown. You can't expect us to stay out of some place, like, and just not expect us to explore. We're adventurers. As he's monologuing, mm -hmm. I'm going to, um... I'm going to try and get behind him. Just, like, while he's, like, focusing on everyone else, like, waiting for an answer. I'm going to try and run behind him, mm -hmm. but uh, also cast a minor illusion of myself where I was, so when he looks back at me, I'm still there. So he doesn't Ooh. see you move. Yes. Roll a d20. 18. 18. Ooh. You are standing perfectly, listening, intrigued, almost amazed by his speech. He looks over you and you are just intensely listening. Well, your illusion is, while you're slowly creeping around him. 
you've discovered that one of Augustus's weaknesses is monologuing, as most bad guys <laughs> have. And he does love to just talk at you and make sure that you're listening to him. In fact, he's not even paying attention to you. Normally, his suit would alert him, or his own you know, combat sensors would let him know there's someone behind him, but he's got a captive audience to talk to. And while that's happening, you manage to sneak up right behind him. What do you do? I want to cast whole person on him, but like on, I want to like on his shoulders to like try and really get onto the aether that's on his exoskeleton. So you almost want to, because the exoskeleton he's wearing is connected by gears and levers and mm -hmm. pulleys and pistons, but every time something moves, a small blue spurt of aether kind of pops out where it's being powered up. You want to use the inherent energy that's in it to make sure it stays still. Yeah, so I'm more focused on the actual exoskeleton part rather so than him. So you're not him. attacking him, you're yeah. attacking the metal that he's wearing. Yes. Okay, roll a d20 <laughs> for that, because you've definitely got behind him. Ten. Ten. He doesn't notice you doing it, and you do manage to focus. Just describe the feeling of you trying to keep this exoskeleton still. So as I'm like putting my kind of hands just above his shoulders, so I'm not actually touching him, so he mm -hmm. won't realize, hopefully. I'm like just gathering some of the aether and just trying to like mold it so it doesn't it doesn't transfer to all of the bits of gears and wires. So every time some kind of joint would move, instead there's not enough strength to move. Yeah, like the aether is just not moving. The lab that you're in contains the silver dragon itself, and so aether is abundant in the air right now. Anything he does feel as part of power fluctuations, he would just dismiss as being close to the dragon itself. So he doesn't realize that you're doing any of this. And while you're not breaking the suit, you're definitely having an effect on it. He again continues on. You've seen the city above. We built this. If you destroy this, if you take this away, if you free this one single solitary creature, do you know how much we'll lose? Have you seen the lives people have? They're comfy. They're happy. They love what they do. There is no pain. There is no suffering. There is no crime in our city. Everything is controlled by the enforcers, and everyone is happy. She tried to do the same thing, you know, five years ago. She took the one thing that would have let this city continue into abundance. Why do you think one creature's life is worth the thousands above us? While he's monologuing, who is responding? You're the charismatic one, dude. <laughs> I mean, now you put it like that. Um, <laughs> You're going to just walk over to him and join him. That's a, that's a fair point you make. But uh, we, we've started, so we'll finish. And Harrog, while Augustus is monologuing and explaining that it is entirely worth torturing and harvesting one dragon for its aether to fulfill the needs of a city of thousands, and Yamara is behind constantly weaving this slow shield of aether energy inside the metal suit itself, you know that Augustus isn't going to let any of you leave here alive. Mm -hmm. Or at least he's going to try not to. What is your goal? What would you think the best thing to do right now in the situation is you've got an incredibly tough enforcer to fight and you've got a dragon in pain you've also got timothy's crumpled body on the floor who is slowly breathing but isn't dead yet is augustus completely fixated on malak he is just standing there trying to talk to all of you trying to get you to understand that what he is doing is the right thing he cares about being seen as morally superior and so he is glancing from Mulak to yourself to the illusion of Yamara, he is still completely oblivious <laughs> to the fact that you are doing this. In fact, roll a d20 to see if you've managed to f figure anything out about his suit. Ten. Ten. You have realized there's quite a lot of aether in the air, and so while you're doing this, you're also pulling some magical energy that he himself isn't generating and melding it into your shield as well. So we've got Yamara trying slowly to destabilize the suit. We've got Mulak just staring, and Augustus feels this strong desire to be accepted as being correct. And the fact that you're nodding along is allowing him just to keep talking. And while he is effectively distracted with his need to be heard, the room is yours. I put my hand in my pocket to feel a smooth little pebble that's kind of just been sat there. Mm -hmm. And I grip it into my hands and I'm just going to absolutely pelt it into the glass window to try and shatter it. Okay. Roll a d20. Oh, big throws. 15. Describe the throw. So I take it out of my hand. I hold it really tight so I can feel how big it is, how light it is, how much strength I'm going to actually need to apply to smash this window. And while he's looking at Moloch, I just take a second and I turn and I just throw it. You pelt this pebble, it flies through the air, it spins, it crashes into the grass, and the glass, unfortunately, is thick. 
So a tiny chip appears back out, but it's not invulnerable. It's not impossible. It's not pure diamond. The stone, however, doesn't get anywhere near as far through as you need it to. But it does chip, letting you know that this glass at least can be broken. As soon as Augustus sees you do this, he runs over to try and stop the pebble, but as soon as he does, his suit creaks in a second, and it takes him a second to kind of yank it forward and throw things, and he stumbles as he does, looking around, confused. His suit's never malfunctioned like this before. He doesn't understand what's going on. He looks over at all three of you, and you're all still standing there, and for a second, he's worried, because he knows that this suit is giving him everything he needs to defeat you all in a fight easily, but without it, it's almost fair, and he does not like the idea of that. He looks around and sees this Aether kind of twisting out of some of the the cogs, some of the gears, some of the connections. He yanks it up, but at no point does he ever consider looking behind. So you are still there, Yamara, still moving. And as the suit starts to move, you can almost feel the energy moving the arms up and down and left and right. Would you like to do anything with that? Um, I want to try and... Um, do you know what? Can I, can I actually move my... Um... Illusion. Yes. Yeah. Can I make her run towards where the pebble is? Yeah, like yep. where it's hit, mm -hmm. and just just try and <laughs> try and just manipulate and uh, mock him, if you will. Yeah. The illusion runs across the central control room that you're in and stands next <laughs> to the large glass opening and almost looks down at the small chip instead, and then looks back toward Augustus, mocking, pointing at this. The fact that what they've built is not completely indestructible. While that's happening, and Augustus is distracted, staring, is there anything else you would like to do? Um, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to let him go in that second. Um, and hoping that he will go towards my mirror image. How um, much are you mocking him with this mirror image? I'm really, like, like <laughs> looking like, really, you built this. This is really bad. Like, you can't do anything. As soon as you release, he begins to sprint. He finally gets control back of the suit and runs straight toward who he assumes is you. He's going for a punch. You can tell he's going for a punch, but he's also smart. He's not going to punch the glass. He knows he would break the glass. He's going to try and make sure he can't do that. But while he runs, he pulls his fist back. He's going in for a punch. Molak, what do you do? So, are there any cables or wires on the floor around? Many. Some under red, some under metal grills, some mm -hmm. under large uh, leather kind of soft carpeting, if you will. But there is yeah. lots of technology in this room. So, I want to grab a cable, mm -hmm. run in front of him, slide, and just try and close the line him straight into the glass. <laughs> into the glass. Into the Roll glass. a d20. Seven. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Seven. It's not pretty. It's not beautiful. In fact, when you reach down and grab one of the wires and kind of yank it up, you almost whip yourself in the face. <laughs> well. You're unsure of what to do, but you are not totally stunned. And as soon as you've got this kind of twisted twine of red wire, you sprint across the room, jumping across some of the tables as well, because they're in your way, and you're like, no, park or vault over them. Mm -hmm. And you've still got Augustus just pelting full speed toward Yamara's illusion, pulling his fist back. And as he pelts, he doesn't even notice you kind of slide in front of him. Do you pull this wire taut and cross in front yeah, of his feet? Yeah, I do. And as he does, he trips, it catches, he stumbles, he goes to catch himself, but he is way too close to the glass. And as he reaches his hands out to catch himself, his hands are already in fist from wanting to punch someone, he just smashes his fist into the glass. And a crack appears. And it spreads very quickly across the entire pane, across the entire sheet. And he steps back. And for the first time, you see him worried and this entire glass panel starts to slowly crack, and you can hear it. You can hear it start to groan and creak against itself, and everything goes very still for a second, and the dragon in the other room almost looks up. And then the amount of aether being harvested from this dragon increases. You can see it, and the pipes begin to flow as the dragon itself realizes what you've tried to do. The glass isn't completely broken yet, and Augustus realizes what you've done. And noticing as well that the illusion is completely shattered, he turns around and stares at you in anger that you have tricked him. He can't believe that you've done that. And as he's annoyed, he reaches down to his hip, pulls out one of the crossbows from earlier, aims and fires. Roll a d20 to avoid. 12. Describe the avoiding. Um, I'm going to just see him pull it out, and I'm going to try to basically, like, go forwards to kind of get out of the way underneath it, so it, like overshoots me. Excellent. So instead of dodging left or right, you mm -hmm. kind of duck down and dive toward him. As you are diving toward him, is there anything you'd like to do? Uh, yeah, um, as I go towards him, I would like to actually like thrust him forward again to push the glass again. Roll a d20 for the power of the thrust. <laughs> 20! <laughs> the mega thrust. <laughs> nice. Augustus reaches down to his hips, pulls out a crossbow, 
generates a bolt of ether on the top and then fires it, expecting you to dodge to the left or right. He's ready to flick his wrist slowly left or right. He does not expect you to just run forward, to dive. And as you dive down, your body almost completely horizontal in the air, the bolt just swings straight past your ear. You can feel the heat of the aether burning into your skin, but it doesn't hurt you too much. And as you are horizontal in the air, both hands forward and a push of magical energy. Augustus has focused so much on creating this bolt and his suit is not entirely fixed from what you've done to it that the push smashes him back against the glass again and the cracks continue to grow. The metal bars bending slightly as he hits from the force of the push itself. He's totally prepared to fight physically, but he was not ready to be thrown around magically. While this is happening, more like, what are you doing? In the room, what... What sort of levers and gears are there? There are many control panels all around this central room which control the majority of the harvesting that's going on to the dragon. There are some levers that stick out of the desk themselves. There are some uh, wheels on the room. There are some gears cranking in the actual wall itself. There are some wires hanging down. There are pipes bending in and out. There's every size and shape of lever and pulley and gear and cog and piston that you could imagine here. This is a fully working central control room and it's dangerous around the side, to be fair. I, I run over to all these these gears and these levers and I start just pulling them in random orders like, you know, family's birthdays <laughs> and celebrity birthdays and just see what happens. Roll a d20. 15. You're remarkably quick at learning exactly what happens. So when you pull one lever down, you look into the dragon room and you see that one of the pipes has shifted to somewhere else and the aether has stopped. Then you pull another and you realize one of the wires has pulled taut or one of the needles poking into the dragon has retracted back into the wall and... It actually doesn't take you long until you can actually work out how this room works effectively. Pulling levers, pressing buttons, is manipulating the surgical instruments in the kind of torture room where the dragon is, the harvesting room, if you will. And it doesn't take you a while until you realize, right, you can actually manipulate this quite well now. You can, if you want to, pull all the levers and take almost all of the pipes and wires and gears out of this dragon if you wanted to. Yes, I will, I will definitely do that. Pulling the gears and levers in the correct order, you see that every time you pull a pipe out of the dragon's body, a little bit of silver blood trickles down the hole where the pipe was in, but then it very quickly heals over. The fact this dragon has got incredible healing powers is one of the reasons it was able to generate so much aether for so long and sustain the city for so long. But everything reaches a death date eventually, which is why the child would have been super useful had they still had it. You take some time and you manage to eventually pull almost all of the wires and gears out of this dragon. And Harrog, while that's happening, what are you doing? Augustus is, uh, where is he? He has just been thrown by a force magic back into the glass again and is almost slightly stunned but quickly regains his composure. So he's standing up behind the glass? He is standing up in front of the glass. No one is yet in the dragon room. So how tall is Augustus compared to the glass? The glass is probably about three or four metres high and Augustus himself probably stands about two and a half high because the suit is quite high, quite tall. Sick. All right. Um, I'm going to grab a table. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to rage so that I'm super, super strong. And I'm going to lift this table up and I want to run towards Augustus. And I would like to vault him so that I have the, the, the velocity of him to kind of like trapeze myself and give me extra force to slam the table into the wall, into, roll, the, into the window. Roll a d20. <laughs> uh, might need a distraction for him though. Okay, roll a d20, then we'll see what these guys can help you with. Seven. <laughs> Seven. One of you guys is going to have to help and support this. I, uh, I pull out the, the flute. <laughs> so you've just been, you've been moving all these yeah. levers, and while you, while you look over, you see a Harrog just start to sprint toward Augustus, and you see Augustus <laughs> just start to sprint. Do you want to grab the table on the way? Yeah, like, before I, before I even start running, you're just yep. kind of like... See the nearest table, and I'm just literally going to. If you rip this up. table from the floor, you're going to also rip out wires and gears and pipes because it's all connected into it. So as you rip it, you also hear this splintering and shattering of metal as your muscles do something that they shouldn't be able to do, but you are so angry right now, you're just like. <laughs> <laughs> as you pick it up, Aether sprays out of the pipes that the table has now been ripped from the floor and has exposed, and then you just begin to sprint while holding this <laughs> table above you. Augustus, realizing you're a lot stronger than he thought you were, regains his composure and begins to run toward you as well. So you're sprinting at each other. Your plan, obviously, jump onto his shoulders and vault over. While this is happening, you realize that he is too focused. How are you going to distract him? I am going to play him the song of my people. 
<laughs> Very <laughs> loudly. Roll a d20. <laughs> uh, 11. What I imagine is while you're pulling these gears and levers and whatnot, you just look over and then you just carry on pulling them with one hand. Yeah. You grab your flute with the other and just quick toot on the flute. Quick toot. And then you just carry on. He's annoyed, mm. but he's not yet interrupted, but he is slightly irritated. Good. One Mulak is not necessarily enough to irritate him. Assist. I would like to haste you. So with the ether that's kind of like coming out of the floor where you just ripped it off, yeah. I'm going to just basically try and like gather some of it oh. and give it to you, put it on your feet, make you super... Bouncy. Roll with advantage because okay. you're helping another player. It's a tiny don't you re-roll that, I saw that. It was, it was a joke. <laughs> you are sprinting. You are carrying a table. As you run, again, the world seems to slow down around you. Augustus in front of you, bounding in this metal suit towards you, hate in his eyes, fists made, ready to punch you. As you are slowly running toward each other, you hear... <laughs> from the flute in the corner and then suddenly your legs feel faster your muscles feel more powerful you begin to take two steps for every step you begin to advance much quicker you look down and see that there is a blue swirl of aether around your legs around your feet it is manipulated from the pipes that have come from the ground that you've ripped the table from and when you jump you jump three or four times higher than you expect Augustus looks up and does not expect you to jump that high he can't even hit that high but your feet land on his shoulders and as they land on his shoulders, you almost bend your knees to absorb the impact and then push and launch yourself toward the glass. Describe how you throw this table into the glass. So I'm going to use the table as a shield. So I'm going to launch off his shoulders, propel myself forward, springboard off him with the table in front of me. In front of, of you, almost holding yeah, yourself like into it and just shield. smash into the I glass. Just smash with my whole body weight just through the, uh, through the glass. The glass is already cracked. It's already started to shatter. It's already started to fall into small shards. And as you impact it, you hear this deafening crash and this roar of kind of glass and sound and explosions around you as Aether just bursts from this room. The table smashes through the glass. You open your eyes and just see shards raining down in front of you. And as you land powerfully on the floor in the lab where the dragon is, the table almost slides along the floor slightly and you're able to stand up and dust yourself off. And as you look up, you are effectively face to face with much bigger, now you're close up to it, a silver dragon that has just started to raise itself up off the floor and stand on its four legs because all of the pipes and all the wires have been taken out of it. And it simply stares at you. It knows what you were trying to do and realizes that you are not a threat. While this is happening, Augustus slides forward to a stop, turns and looks and realizes the glass is smashed and the dragon has almost been completely freed. He doesn't quite know what to say. He just looks around and sees who he can punch for this because this is a problem for the entire city. He notices that Molak is playing with the levers and so Augustus reaches down, grabs a load of the wires and pipes in the floor, squeezes them into almost a congealed ball of metal and just launches it across the room at you as fast as he can. Roll to avoid. 13. Describe the avoiding. I, I do like a sideways roll, uh, try to get under a table nearby and just avoid the entire mess that's coming at me. You manage to roll under the table and you hear the impact of this ball of metal and wires just smash into the table. It almost knocks it back slightly and you're pushed along the ground slightly as well. After he throw that ball, how are you responding? I'm sprinting straight towards him. Straight towards him? Yeah. I, I'm, okay. The plan is uh, dodge round him last minute and get into the room with the dragon. As get weird as that sounds, that's the safest place. Into the room with the <laughs> <Yeah>. dragon. <laughs> Never thought I'd say sprint. that. He's too distracted having trying to grab things and just throw things at you. While all this is happening, Yamara, what are you doing? Oh, my God. Okay, so they're kind of basically all in front of me at the moment. Um, you're in the room. You're going towards the room, and I'm just like... Right now, more like is trying uh, to sprint past Augustus. Okay. Um, I am going to... Um... Anharag, do you still have uh, purple juice? Yeah, I do. Um... And I'm like gonna instruct you to basically like throw it here or throw it on the floor so that when when he's running he trips over. Okay, I figure out what you're trying to do, <laughs> and I'd like to just take the the bottle and throw it as far as I can to kind of like the separation between you and Augustus kind of like lands straight there, so it creates a puddle. The bottle itself is remarkably alcoholic. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I, I forgot about that. that. I, did not, I did not forget about You pull about out this. this purple bottle and you launch it through the air and it begins to spin. The cork even pops off midair and as it spins, you see this lovely trail of liquid begin to spiral through the air as it goes. Mulak runs past Augustus. Roll a dexterity check. 
against Augustus. 18. You sprint. Augustus realizes exactly what you're about to do and so reaches down, pulls out the crossbow from his other hand. He's got one in each hand, focuses, manages to create two bolts and then just blast them both at you. As you see these bolts coming towards you, describe how you would avoid them. I'm, I'm going for like the tallest jump you've ever seen. <laughs> I, I'm going to try and vault over them. It works. It works. It's a perfect roll. Is it landing into a forward roll? Yes. You land into a forward roll just the side of him. He almost looks down to see you roll past him at the same time. You run forward and you jump over the small amount of remaining shattered glass into the room with the dragon. As this has happened, a glass bottle is about to smash into the floor. What are you doing with it, Yamara? So where is like, is it going to be on like around him when it smashes? When the glass is bottle he... smashed on the floor, there was enough liquid into it that it would create a puddle and that puddle would likely touch Augustus's feet. Okay, so um, I'm going to... Can I try and set the puddle on fire? Yes, Is you it, can. It's alcoholic, so... Yeah. Roll a d20. Nine. Nine. It's not beautiful. It's not perfect. And Augustus realises this is exactly what you're trying to do. So as soon as he sees this, you have thankfully distracted him from attacking anymore because as soon as he realises this is what's happening, he kind of jumps back, brings both arms up in front of him and a blue bubble kind of appears. You can tell it's using a lot of the aether in his suit, but he's forcing this bubble in front of Chris as the liquid just catches fire and bursts into flames. The heat beginning to snap some of the wires in the room around and some of the pipes begin to melt slowly as well because this is an intense heat. Things in the wall fizzle, they crackle, mm. they pop. Some of the dials on the table start to just start to spin around with the heat in the room and you think there's probably an old sprinkler system that might kick in at some point but it's been so long <laughs> since it's actually been maintained <laughs> it's not doing anything. Augustus is standing there holding this shield up against himself while you are in the room with the dragon and the room with the dragon. While he's defending himself from the fire, you are still in the main central control room. Do you wish to join these other two in the room? Yeah, so like to get past the fire, I would want to like try and like um, manipulate it a little bit to like kind of cordon him off to mm -hmm. like the side basically so he's like stuck against the wall so I can then slip into the room with the dragon. So you're almost walking through the central control lab using your hands to kind of move this wall of fire to keep it as a defensive barrier between you and Augustus. Yeah, so he, he realises that he can only move very, very slowly while holding the shield up. So he's actually stepping into the fire and he is slowly pacing himself through it, but he can't run through it. So as you are drawing it back toward yourself, he is walking into it and holding this defensive shield up, but he can't get to you. And you're able to step over the pile of glass into the room with the dragon at the same time. You're all in the lab room itself. There are wires, gears, pulleys around the place. And unfortunately, the fire has now managed to slowly creep over toward all the wires and buttons that you were pressing earlier, which you know control the pipes and the needles. In fact, you're able to just to see that one of the wires pulls down as a needle flies past in front of your face, attached to a long metal arm and stabs where the dragon would have been. You realize that everything in this room, all the pipes, all the wires and all the needles are about to go a little bit haywire and stab into the center of the room where the dragon was. Mm. Knowing that, what do you do? Is there um, like a main source of energy for all these instruments that you can see coming into the room? As they are moving, they're actually slowing down because you realize they're all effectively powered by Aether and the stores of Aether are very limited because everything was being sapped away from this dragon as it was needed. And as the dragon is now no longer within this kind of lab or no longer connected up to it, everything is starting to slow down. The only thing you can see that's still working are things that have their own small charged up power source, such as Augustus's suit. Okay. Hmm. What you As want. I see them all like swinging in, I, I shout to the guys, like, we, we need to get to the edge of the room. Okay. Because if we stay in the middle, we're dead. You hear that. What do you do? Um, I look at Siwa Yamara is, mm -hmm. so you're next to us. Mm -hmm. um, look at the dragon. And the back of the room, is that like behind the dragon? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then I kind of like, I want to grab you by your waist and then just like, kind of like do this to the dragon and just mm -hmm. like back push everyone to the end back. of the room. It realizes yeah. what you're doing and it just slowly starts to pace back. And as you all manage to get to the edge of the room, the instruments all kind of swing in and start to judder. And then as they swing back out to the center, no one has been hit by any of them. And it seems the Aether has started to fall down and is no longer powering this entire lab. Unfortunately, the flames have started to dissipate as Augustus has effectively managed to pull out one of the wires on his own suit and sprays a stream of Aether from his suit onto the fire in front almost acting as a fire extinguisher, and then plugs it back in. Doing so has drained his suit, unfortunately, though, quite a lot. It's not going to last that much longer. He steps forward. 
You are all in the room with the dragon, a large square room with a single door behind you that would effectively lead out of the lab. Where the glass wall was is shattered, and Augustus is still standing in the control room where you originally started. As he is staring at you, you notice that another enforcer enters the control room, and another and another. Timothy is still lying in the corner, effectively heavily breathing. Augustus has been entirely distracted and hasn't even bothered trying to fight him again. But it turns out that unfortunately the reinforcements are here. Another and another and another. You are standing in the room with the dragon, looking into the room that you were previously in. Glass lines shattered on the floor. And four, five, six, seven more enforcers coming down the original corridor you came in, filling up the control room. More than you can possibly fight. You need to get out of this lab. How? More like any ideas. Yamara, you can speak to dragons, right? Yeah, I... What? Can, you, can you ask your friend here to, like, the door, potentially? Like, smash How it down? big is the dragon compared to, like... Dragon's probably about as big as the room we're currently in. Okay, so it, it can leave the room, though. It can... It would be able to... It wouldn't leave the door behind it, because that's like a regular human-shaped door, but to leave the room, it would need to go back through the smashed glass through the room that's currently full of Enforcers and Augustus, and then up the original kind of corridor that you took to get down here. That would involve fighting past a lot of people. Okay, and you can, however, talk through it. Okay. Is there, so there's no other way out? It's just that one way? We can't, like, there's no... What's above us? Above you, when you look up at the ceiling, you realise that all of the pipes and all of the wires almost join into a central funnel leading back up to the top. And when you were above ground, you did see that there were some pipes and some wires kind of breaching the surface of the ground from the original hut, this concrete bunker that you were in. And as you look up, you realize that that's probably the, the least defended area of this entire lab. The ceiling is not necessarily made of concrete and metal, but just wires and pipes. Um, so I'm gonna try and talk to the dragon and ask what its name is. Um, who are you? What's your name? The dragon is able to talk to you almost psychically. And while it cannot give you a name that you would be able to recognize, it gives you images in your mind of flying around these hills and these mountains locally 35 years ago, of being caught, of being captured, of being pinned down, and then of being harvested for its aether, of the lab effectively being built around it and the city being created. It cannot give you a name because it doesn't remember its name. The only thing it seems to respond to is the name Helena because that is the last human name that it trusted and cared about. Okay, um, so I'm going to... Can you fly? Do you think you could fly? Its wings are damaged and broken and they haven't been used in a long time. It can probably glide, but it may not be able to fly. Okay. Um, can we use the aether to yeah. like go up the same well, way I use my feet? I don't know, but I was going to... So... I'm going to try and see if I can, like, instead of the Aether coming from the dragon, mm -hmm. is can I maybe ask for some help to pull a pipe mm -hmm. and use your strength to give Aether back to the dragon? Yes, roll mm -hmm. a d20. Eight. Roll a d20 to assist. More like as well, please. Yes. Two. <laughs> Thirteen. Excellent. Thank you. So roll 23 in total with you all working together. Augustus steps over the glass <laughs> barrier that you have smashed. All of the enforcers behind step in unison toward. They're not bothered about taking you into custody anymore. They're going to kill you. While this is happening, and Harrow, describe how you would rip a pipe off the wall. Um, hmm. So I go over to have a look at one of the thickest pipes that we can see. But not that pipe. More like make sure she grabs the right pipe. Oh, yeah. You No, not that one. You want the, the medium-sized one that's kind of like hexagonal? Oh, OK. Yeah, that one. OK, right. Grab it. You nearly ripped the water pipe off the wall. That would have been bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sunk us all. <laughs> uh, grab it, two hands, and then I want to, like, swing myself back, and then with a kick, just kind of, like, yeah, kick okay. with my feet. There is aether inside this pipe. Help. Okay. And Harrod, pull it off the wall. Okay, so um, while you're kind of, like, actually pulling it off the wall, I'm going to kind of put the drop and try and get the dragon to tell it to go mm -hmm. towards where you are mm -hmm. and where one of the holes would have been mm -hmm. for the aether to come out. I'm going to position it so that you can just like, it's this is going to hurt, but you'll yep. feel better afterwards. The dragon realizes what's happening. The pipe is ripped off the wall and begins to 
kind of pulsate with blue energy falling out of it, a liquid going into a gas, going into a solid, going into a liquid, magical energy spilling into the air. And as that does, you're able to push this pipe effectively back into one of the open wounds that the dragon has on the side of it. And it does start to yelp, but not much. Its pain tolerance is remarkably high, and it begins to glow slightly more silver than usual. It steps back into the center of the room and looks. It realizes the enforcers are encroaching on it, and it is trapped. And so it rears its head back, focuses, and then everything goes quiet for a second. All of the aether seems to stop as a large blue ball builds up inside this dragon's throat and then just gets fired up. It burns a huge cylinder above you. There's almost no noise when this happens. It's strange. It's beautiful, it's powerful, and it melts the ceiling. You look up, and then when you finally manage to blink, because the brightness of this is absolutely shredding you, you realize that all the enforcers have stopped and have been shocked by this. You look up. Augustus is not sure what to do. And when you look up, you see the sky. The blast of aether from the dragon's mouth has melted the ceiling and given you a perfect escape route up. Unfortunately, you are still remarkably far underground in this lab. And as you look up at the beautiful, brilliant sky, you see a blade. And then you see an air balloon and an airship hover over. You can just about see the face of an old man <laughs> looking down, super confused at what's just happened. <laughs> but shrugging his shoulders through this hole that you've just blasted in the roof, a rope ladder, a rope ladder, a rope ladder, and then after a second, a large net falls down, <laughs> open, <laughs> connected to a couple of ropes up to the top, and you realize your escape route is here, but you've got to be quick. More like, what are you doing? I'm jumping on the ladder. And Harrock? Um, I'm gonna put the net over the dragon and just kind of scoop him up. Mm -hmm. So he can He almost up understands this. this and kind of walks in willingly and kind of curls up into a small ball to make sure he can fit in. What are you doing, Yamara? I'm gonna um bring up some new flames mm -hmm. um across where the wall was so that they can't immediately get to us while we're escaping. Are you using your own magic or are you using some of the magic of the room itself as well? Um so the aether's probably still dripping out of Absolutely. the pipe, so I'm gonna just like whip it around. Effectively and what you do fire. is you turn that pipe into a flamethrower. Yes. <laughs> the pipe is just kind of pulsating magical energy, so you focus and then just with a whip of your hand, almost this massive blast of... The fire is so hot it goes blue and then almost white. As you see, it just rip across, creating this perfect barrier. Not even Augustus is going to be able to protect from this, and so simply steps back a couple of times, ordering the enforcers behind him to step back as well. As you grab onto the rope ladders and you feel the floor move away from underneath you, and you lift up. You hear the chop of blades above you, and you fly up. Pipes, wires, gears, everything passing you, but melting and dripping with the blast of aether the dragon originally threw up at the sky until eventually you burst out of the bunker itself, the city around you, and you fly even higher. Holding onto the rope ladders, you look around, surrounding the bunker, hundreds of enforcers all waiting for you to come out the front entrance, all of them looking up at you, amazed at what's happening. Above you, you can see old man Jenkins leaning out the side, checking that he's got all of you as the Princess Helena airship flies for the final time up and away. And just as it's about to leave the remnants of the city, you hear a horrible blast of war, a horn impossibly loud, deep and shrill at the same time as you look over and see the black mass of metal of the Sentinel begin to twist in the sky and focus towards you. You see a gun on the front begin to gather aether power about to blast the airship you're on out of the sky. And we'll find out what happens in the next episode. Oh! <laughs> I was like, I said, I was going to go!